Uh, well, thanks for coming. I mean, I didn't expect that many people. I didn't even expect that this would be this big room. Um, anyway, the interesting part is the guy with the camera told me I should point to this screen when I have to point in something. And most of the people are on this side. Going to be fun. Um, okay, so 100% big data, 0% Hadoop, 0% Java. I'm Pablo Baron from the company code Centric AG. Do we have people from Germany in the audience? Nobody. I'm all alone here. Okay, well, basically in Germany. So I'm um, quite a no-name, so I need to introduce, to briefly introduce myself. I wrote a couple of German books, and I assume that nobody have, um, has read them here in this audience. But, well, overall, I've bought like, uh, I've sell, sold like 300, 400 copies of them, of all of them. So it's okay. <laughs> it's just a hobby. Well, actually, it's, uh, I'm using writing books for digging into things and, and uh, understanding them, learning them a lot. So I spent like two and a half years writing a German Erling book. Most of the time it was learning, um, scratching my head. So, um, well, some people say I'm a, uh, I hate Java. It's probably, I'm probably known for that. Well, I don't hate Java. I'm kind of not really... Um, liking this enterprise Java thing. And some people also, may, maybe the same people say I'm grumpy, according to my tweets. Well, the reason for this is I'm in the middle of my midlife crisis, so forgive me. It will pass at some point. So the current book is uh, out there is this orange one, The Big Data for IT Decision Makers. And it's an attempt to describe to those people who actually spend money or have budgets to describe the whole area and to, to make them understand that it's not all about one single tool, but it's more about analytical approaches, it's more about um, mathematics and stuff like that. Uh, different tools needed to, to be taken into consideration. Does anybody know what big data is here in this audience? Oh, one guy knows this. You know this? What is that? How would you say it? Okay. Cool. Uh, congratulations, you know more than me. <laughs> I've kind of tried to understand this area for a couple of years. Well, what I've, I'll be introducing here is, well, an experiment. It's not a production system. It's an experiment. It has Erlang in it. It also has different things in it. And, uh, well, here's the story of this. Oh, you know this book? Yeah. Anybody from Russia here? It's pretty thick and, okay, <laughs> cool. We should have a chat afterwards. Uh, it's pretty thick and... Uh, for more, most of the people who had to learn this, also pretty boring. Anyway, I was sitting in a, well, in, in a one-day talk for IT decision makers about big data and blah, blah, and uh, foobar and whatever. And somebody from the company called Intensity, they, they, they do some, some interesting stuff. It looks pretty nice. So what, what they actually do, they talk social media in order to find out if somebody is ranting about a product and then they just point the company at this uh, problem so the company can react on this. And they have told that they have like patents in machine learning and stuff like that, many different things. So it was like Houdini magic, you know Houdini? It's like phew, smokes and fire and stuff. Um, and I'm sitting there a little bit skeptic. I mean, I'm, I'm, I have more general knowledge in many things for now over 20 years I'm in this industry, kind of expertise in some of them. Well, mathematics is not, is not really the expertise of mine, but I'm learning hard. So I'm just, I'm skeptic. I'm typically skeptic about things like that. And what I have spoken about looked like a bunch of 
queues and pipes and filters and, well, some, some data being pipelined from A to B, from, to, uh, from B to C, then notifications to somebody. It looked like some, some natural language processing which I did as a hobby a while back, playing around with things. Well, of course, it looks some, like some math. And, well, basically, you can, you can cover this with the topic of machine learning. So I just thought, I'm, I'm at this conference, or actually in this place, I have two nights in the hotel, and um, my biggest problem when I'm traveling, I can't sleep in hotels. I don't know why, but I use this time to, to learn new things. And then next day, when, when I'm going to the customer, I'm sleeping there. Uh, it's not very good for business, <laughs> as you can imagine. Well, anyway, I have, I have a couple of nights here, so let's, let's, uh, uh, let's do something. I can, I can probably tinker something like that. So, let's see if this piece works. I hope so. So it takes a little time. It's an automated, Apple script automated demonstration here. Just let me wait because uh, Apple script gets confused when I click around here before things start. Actually, I can zoom in. Okay, here we go. It's not very interesting what is happening there. I can just point at this windows. So um, what they did at this company, they, I mean, they just suck from data sift stream and uh, analyze this data. Well, it's pretty expensive when you want to experiment with this, so you would probably go for the firehose of Twitter, um, which is, I will explain how good it, how, how bad it is. So I, I've actually cheated for this demonstration. It's stored locally, so I don't want to rely on, uh, on anything, on APIs, on whatever, because Twitter does some limitations there. Uh, here's the never-ending stream of very many, um, well, tweets. This is also something which does basic filtering. I will explain some concepts here. This is the notification window. So these links would go to the so-called Twitter team because many companies have established something called Twitter team, and this Twitter team is responsible for, well, if somebody writes a tweet about something, they will look at it and say, and say come on, maybe you need help or something. And th this one, the last one, is just a map reduced in parallel to this. I've stored this already in the React store, and it's, a, it's just a small part of very many tweets being filtered out with, with the essence here, getting down to negative 81 and positive 159 of them. So let's just let it run for a while and get back to the presentation. Oh yeah, well, a little gimmick that I did afterwards is just, whenever I have a location information, I just let make this uh, green and red dot jump here on the map. It's cool, right? <laughs> Well, you can basically impress people with this, but not the geeks, not the audience here. You can impress, you, pr you can impress managers with this, so this is, uh, this is Houdini magic. Easily. So, okay. So, I basically have two use cases. Let's look at how I can get the data in. Um, well, you can zoom from from the stream of messages where people, as I say here, where they say things before they think about these things. Also, I do on Twitter, so this explains this grumpy part. So just drink this big data warm straight from the fire hose of Twitter, which is absolutely limited. And you have two basic use cases. One is you, you need immediate notification. When somebody is ranting about a product or a company, you would want to react immediately on it. You don't have time 
to, to do it once a day or something, because probably the person who's rented, it's typical for social uh, networks, he or she has just forgotten about this next day when you come back to it, so you need to react on this. I've learned from, from some customers that there have been real huge problems when, when somebody is ranting about a product and the whole revolution starts, so people start burning these products. So these things happen, so you want to be fast there. And the batch part of it is what, where you do some, uh, well, this, this uh, collect the information and, and run some statistics on, on, this, on this whole stuff in order to understand how a product would perform, <laughs> maybe make some predictions for the next month, maybe just kick this product if it doesn't perform according to social media. So here are the bubbles, because we always need an architecture um, picture. So it's pretty simple. Feeds come in, get queued, get filtered. This is a very important part. I will, I will emphasize this later. Get filtered, then I forked, uh, forked through queues, again, for alerting, where somebody would uh, react. This is what you saw in the right uh, top window. Uh, it gets queued, formalized, so I don't have a dat data chaos. Well, actually, I just uh, cut off some information from the tweets, formalized them. Store, and then I can do my batch. Through queue, I will explain this part as well, because of technology I use there. Then I just run MapReduce jobs and do some sentiment analysis, aggregate the results, and can report, and somebody will react on this as well. Pretty simple. No real Houdini magic. So what is the tech here? Two languages, Python and Erlang. Well, it's not only Erlang, it's also Python. So Tweepy uh, is for, uh, for the Twitter firehose, and I also experimented with some crawlers and stuff, but it's not in the demo here. So queuing is done with RabbitMQ through Pika. RabbitMQ is also a system written in Erlang, so we are in the, uh, at the Erlang conference. Also fits, kind of. We'll explain it in a little. So, React through protocol buffs, normal. MapReduce with a modified version of Disco. This is probably something where I spent most of my time during this couple of nights playing with this. Do you know Disco? Ever heard of Disco? Okay. Ever compared Disco with Hadoop? Nobody? Okay. We will talk about this briefly. So well, this, this uh, jumping dot is just WebStomp plugin uh, on Rabbit, J vector map and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I've also implemented a, a corpus for those from you who know about natural language processing, what is a corpus. I will also explain this briefly in a little, in just a little. So what is the math, mathematical part of it? It's also pretty boring for those who are into mathematics. Analytics are done with NLP through NLTK. NLTK is the library for natural language processing. Well, it's Python. Well, it's kind of Fortran and C underneath, but it has a Python API. It's look Pythonic. Um, algorithmic training is NLTK trainers. Um, it's not very interesting for the Erlang community. Algorithms, um, naive bias, it's absolutely sufficient because of the nature of tweets and how people tweet where, well, how you build the sentence doesn't make a lot of sense all the time, or most of the time. So it's uh, absolutely okay to do naive bias on it. Decision tree for some, um, well, for just for, for, for hierarchical decision here. Trigrams for language rec recognition, and so on and so forth. We will go through it a little. I'll also filter. So this is probably the very important part, because what I experience with big data projects, and I'm, I'm doing these big data projects, trying to avoid making myself an evil person, but, well, we know about recent developments in this area. I don't have to mention them. But anyway, um, so people, most of the people are right now are just collecting data. Everything which comes in, everything they can buy, they just collecting it. They almost do nothing with it. And from my point of view, what I've learned, and I'm not the expert in statistics and stuff, but still, when you want your mathematical um, or math-based analysis, which is a given, it has to be math-based, when you want 
it to be real good, you have to clean your data. You have to filter every garbage coming in. You surely need something like uh, explore, exploratory analytics, but you can do it on samples. You can just write like two, three days, store them to the data store or wherever you want them to have, and then you would try to find patterns and stuff like that. I'm, I'm not into collecting everything flying in, so I'm more into filtering up front and, and ensuring that the algorithms don't have garbage to compute on. So simple name and antibiot filtering is, is also done here with, with some own corpora. I will also explain this. Sentiment analysis is based on public and own corp corpora. This will also be explained. And I also filter trolls because, because of the nature of uh, Twitter firehose. Did anybody of you do any work on uh, social, social media streams or something? You know about? Okay. Happy with this? It, it gets less and less every day, right? What you get out there. Well, it has a reason because they want to sell this data actually and want to avoid foreign clients because they can otherwise sell, um, sell ads through their own clients and stuff like that. Well, I can understand this development. Well, about some numbers. It's not sexistic, I'm sorry. It's just uh, numbers. Numbers are sexy. So, yeah. Um, I'm also not into this numbers porn. For what I did here, it was sufficient to run this on this machine. And you don't need huge clusters for this, huge Hadoop clusters where you just, well, use maybe 2% of the whole machinery per machine because you don't know what you do there. So some numbers. Um, here, it's very important to impress pe people with numbers. Managers are very easily impressed by numbers. When you say, I can process like terabytes of data per second, and I don't even have to store this data, everybody is immediately impressed. Geeks who are at this conference will ask, huh? <laughs> or probably when they do stream processing. I, I love this, this stream processing. Um, benchmarks because they compare each other uh, or each other with each other by saying hey i can process 10 millions of events per second yes well theoretically but as soon as you have some logic there as soon as you start compute as soon as you start running mathematical algorithm uh, algorithms on this which are more complex than just building sums it gets real nasty so it, uh, from my point of view, these this benchmarks are not very, well, it, don't say a lot. But still, you can impress people with numbers. So here's some numbers on this MBA. Not very impressive. But still, you get around about 10,000 uh, chaotic text messages from the feed, from the fire uh, firehose. I can easily process them because I'm doing queuing. I mean, when you queue and you have kind of memory, so you can fill up your queues. Um, I store around about 8,000 messages per minute here in a React with N of three, with three nodes here on, with, on this one machine. Um, analytics are done, well, the basic analytics, fil filtering and then just the positive negative aggregation and stuff like that is done, well, around about 7,000 messages per minute. In this demo, you see around about one and a half million tweets stored on this machine in one file. I don't suck from, from the firehose because it wouldn't, get, uh, it wouldn't give you this performance there. Or it, was li it would limit you out actually at some point. So I've just stored them and I'm processing them in a demo. It runs in about the stream processing in about seven minutes. And this MapReduce was just easy on, on uh, several thousand stored um, um, events here, stored messages. So what is more important is I've actually learned a lot in a couple of nights. So when you, when you go for social media streams, however they call them, you will get these people there. You know about the believers? Does anybody do? Do we have fans of Justin Bieber here in this, in this room? Ooh, yeah. I'm also into progressive rock, man, so it's cool. <laughs> whatever progressive is. 
Anyway, um, I was fluted. Is this the word, right? Like, by, by, I just had the feeling that almost everything is a believer on Twitter. So I roughly did it. I, I, I did a rough calculation and I just found out that it's about 60% of what I get from the sample stream. And what is a sample stream on Twitter? You get a one second sample, which is at maximum 1% of all tweets all over the world, and this sample is equal for anybody who will access this stream or suck from this stream, stream in this second. So everybody is equal there, and you get around about 60% of garbage. It's real garbage. It's, I mean, well, it's not useful. <laughs> Almost the whole rest of it are trolls and uh, people that are not serious, people like me, tweeting. Sometimes I'm, I'm serious. So I ended up implementing something that was real nasty. I have it out on GitHub as well. It's called WP Corpus. So what I did is I, I just, I've, I've got myself a Wikipedia dump. And Wikipedia is, well, we can argue about the quality of categorization on Wiki Wikipedia because, well, it's crowdsourced, right? So where people have no real direct moderation control there, they can put any category on any article basically. But anyway, it gives you categories. Did anybody of you do, uh, do uh, any uh, natural language processing? Or heard about it, read about it? Okay, well, I mean, you don't need to be expert these days to, 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 ex to, actually, to actually be able to start with this. So what is a corpus? Corpus is a, a collection of tagged or classified something. So it can be text. Most of the time it's texts. And when you, when you want to, to, to classify a negative and positive, uh, well, sentiment, for example, you can go with a corpus which is pre-tagged or pre-classified where left is, well, 1,000 documents are negative, 1,000 documents are positive, so you can train your algorithms on this. And afterwards, you can just send your text through these algorithms and it will try to find out if it's more negative or it's more positive and so on and so forth without digging deeper into it. I've implemented a, um, a corpus. Well, it's an active corpus, so it's not only text which is text, so I have a small database. Well, it's not written in Erlang. It's PyTables. It's good for indexing things. Um, it's Pythonic with a lot of C code. Um, so anyway, what this corpus does is uh, pretty simple. I, ju I just can combine several categories of Wikipedia articles into one class or one anti-class, for example, then I can do binary classification. Say it's left or it's right. Um, yeah, for those of you who are interested, can look it up on GitHub. Let's look at filtering. Filtering is pretty complex thing, generally. I would never underestimate filtering. Y you know about this guy, DHH? Anybody doing Ruby here? Okay. Well, he's an awesome, awesome hacker. He's real cool. But uh, his name, his readable name is DHH. We all know, or probably those who are into it, know who is DHH, right? Uh, how would computer know about this? It's not a real name. It's like something. It's just three characters here. So it's pretty, pretty complex to filter based on on real names from uh, base, uh, filter the Twitter stream or things like that. Absurd profile bias. In this community, this guy should be well known. You know James Golick? Real awesome hacker, deep, low level. But look at the profile bio. I think he, has, he still has this one. So when I would filter, well, very negative stuff, this one will just fall through, right? And when this guy with his three, 4,000 followers rants about a product, this can have influence. Not an easy problem. Zvi, here you go. I owe you an explanation on this one. Well, it's pretty easy. We, we met in San Francisco a year back, and six months afterwards, your tweets were marked with San Francisco, so you just went back to Israel. And I mean, eh? you cannot rely on location. Well, you can't even rely on location set, set by people themselves because in my location, I just say this 
or something different now. This is the location string there. Where is that? Where is that? Language recognition. Wow. That's not an easy problem. Google is the best, has the best, well, publicly available language recognition uh, technology around. But you can also fool uh, Google's engine into chaos. Like when you, when you use lead, it will just recognize it as German. <laughs> yes, well, because, because of based on my IP address. It doesn't have any chance anymore. It will just say, okay, he's from Germany, so let's, let's assume it's German. So what worked pretty well was um, I used Spanish. I used an LTK all the time, so it has a couple of corpora, corpora that you can use in order to recognize language. So it's, 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 it's done with trigrams. Trigrams are like three letters uh, together. So you can measure it. You can also do an AF bias on it on whatever you like. And you can do, well, poor guy's language recognition with this. So Spanish worked like a magnet for everything except German and English for every single language. And I, also, I only want, uh, wanted to know about English and German rants, so it was okay. Somebody told me that, that Spanish and Arabian has some, some common roots. I cannot say if it's true, but uh, probably this explains this in a way. So I mean it's, well, Unicode and stuff, okay. Disco, let's, let's get back to Erlang, which is more important for this conference. So what I wanted to do was, I wanted to store my stuff. I wanted to store all the messages in a React store because I'm a real React fan. I'm doing a lot of work with React. And so there is one problem when you have a data store and you want to run MapReduce, well, with a tool like Hadoop or Disco. This problem is called data locality. When you don't run your mappers, well, well, parts of reducers, however you have your topology there. When you don't run mappers on the same nodes, on the same machines where the data is actually stored on physically, you will have to move the data around. And this will take a lot of time. And I'm, I'm, I'm not the fan in losing, of losing time, even if, if you can afford this. So my idea was to teach Disco to sit directly on React nodes and to suck directly from the machine where this one disco node is running on. So the mapper would just, wouldn't have to, uh, to rely on the data lying on some different nodes. We just get it from the node it's on. Oh, well, that, that was a pain in the ass, to be honest. Uh, it wasn't that easy. Uh, disco is a pretty cool system. You should, you should go through the code. It's built very well. And it's, it combines Erlang and Python. And you, and you see that it's done by, by good programmers. Well. My problem was I, want, I didn't want only to extend it, I had to modify the kernel of it, the very kernel of it, in order to run Erlang code um, as a schema there, or a scheme, they call it a scheme, and then to, to, to accept they have this DDFS uh, as the underlying data uh, file system or a pseudo file system. So I wanted React to do this job. Well, those of you who, who've been digging React code will know that, well, yeah, basically, you can ask React as a store, as a whole, give me data. So it will flood you with data then. Well, it's not accessing by key, so it will flood you. When you're not fast enough, it will penalize you. It will, uh, it will stop transferring at some point when you're not fast enough. But anyway, this is not the problem. The problem is I wanted to read from one node. I'm on this node. I, I didn't want them, uh, them to agree on something. I didn't want to go through coordinator because data would flow from node to node before I even get it in the disk node. So the basic idea was to go low level. I asked Scott Fritchie for, for help um, and he pointed me at some functions I could use. So I'm sucking straight from, um, from vnodes. So when you have n of three, you can assume that there are, well, at least three copies of the same key somewhere in the store. So I also experimented with some uh, probabilistic approaches there. 
I didn't come very far, but well, actually, when, when it's sunshine scenario, you can just divide the results by three. But it's not that easy in a production system. Would never be easy like that. So some more work needs to be done there. And what is more important, you want to be very fast there. So I started going with, with Disco's uh, approach to this. When data gets delivered, you would go with a, with a Unix pipe there and we'll pipe the data through. It's not fast enough, so I used RabbitMQ. And I'm just filling up React writes or React vnodes deliver data straight to a Rabbit queue, and I will just consume from it um, in a loosely coupled way. Then North, he has not, nothing to do with Erlang, but is, is a very well-known and smart guy, brought me to this idea, actually. I kind of could think of it of my, on my own, but, well, didn't have the, that much time during this hack. Oh, well. Mixing languages in one project. Um, I like Python. I seriously like Python for well, Python is a foundation for very many for very many scientific libraries and stuff like that. But when you when you're doing a project within let's say 20 hours and you have to quickly switch from one language to the other, they have almost nothing in common, right? So I just forgot punctuation in Erlang all the time, and. On the, other, on the other hand, what the feature that I really like about Erlang is the pattern matching. You can pattern match everything in Erlang. This is probably the, the only language where you can pattern match everything. You, you can pattern match function heads, you can pattern match uh, messages, you can pattern match, match everything. It's pretty cool. But I don't have to explain this to this community. Well, embedding Python in Erlang would be a real pain in the ass, but let's skip this one. Let's get back to sentiment analysis. Does everybody know what sentiment analysis is? Cool. Awesome. I had to learn how to do it right. It's, in my case, it's about strong sentiment analysis. But look at this tweet. I mean, we are human. Are we able to say this is positive or it's negative? Ha! Huh. Well, when, when, you, when you're in the machine and you would try to count these uh, features here, you will probably end up with zero. It's like it can be positive, it can be negative. I'm not sure. Well, you can also say cold is for some people something negative. Oh my God, is something positive. Whatever. It's hard. It's a real hard job to, first of all, to classify human text and then to classify something which is absolutely chaotic. And this, this sentence building there is like, well, I mean, with tweet, uh, we probably should, should invest more time into, into building correct sentences on Twitter as well. But I think it's not the right platform for that. <laughs> so I ended up for strong sentiment analysis for classification of negative and positive text, I ended up creating another corpora. Well, it was one corpus and another experiment. Do you know these two guys? Well, Linus, of course. He's the one who's changed the world. But when you want to go for a negative text, you would just pick any of his rants in any of the forums he's uh, <laughs> communicating through. Seriously. I mean, this is negative. I mean, he's an absolutely smart guy who has managed to change the world in a way, but still, from the perspective of the text, it's negative. Like, you are a maroon man, and then you have an explanation, so probably you would drop the explanation and go with, a, with some part of it. I just said it's negative. You, do you know the other one? Any Python guys here around? This is probably not the most popular person in the Erlang community. His name is Zed Shaw. Um, Zed is a, well, from, from my point of view, he's a great hacker, but he's kind of loud and very, he has a strong opinion. So when you read something like, programmers need to learn statistics or I will kill them all, I can't really disagree with, well, I understand the meaning of this sentence. 
but uh, I can't really disagree, but you can absolutely say it's negative. So the whole text which comes afterwards is also negative. So just, I just picked them uh, all, uh, all of the, well, for, from some blogs and stuff, just a couple of articles and I had like 100 of them and said, this is negative. So I had a stronger negative classification ability there. Frequently asked questions. Before you ask questions, I will ask these questions myself. Why am I doing this? Well, I want, I want, I, I'm, I'm learning all the time. Most of the time I'm learning, to be honest. And I wanted to go deep. This is also why I started doing Erlang back in 2005 or experimenting with them. I'm not really doing any serious uh, Erlang-based implementations. I'm more in general, uh, generally into technologies and things like that. I'm probably known by some of you by starting the project called React Mongo. Ever heard of it? was an attempt to sell to, Re to Mongo clients, sell React as the Mongo database. So digging into Mongo's wild protocol and ex experimenting with this. We did it together with Creston until we ran into some problems there. Um, it's outside of the topic here. So it's very interesting to combine computer science with math, however lang whatever language you use there. Why not just use Hadoop? This is the most interesting question here. Yes, well, I, didn't, I really didn't want to run this one on the JVM. I just wanted to see something different. My first language was, was assembly back in, uh, in the 90s. And well, the JVM came along and I did some Java work for business as well. I absolutely admit this. I'm still doing this. Um, and I have these two use cases. I have this MapReduce stuff and I have this immediate notification thingy where I absolutely know from my own experience I did some work with Hadoop, some, well, more or less serious work. It will probably never get there to be a real time or near real time. I mean, real time is a, is, is a different term for computer scientists and for, for marketing people. But still, it's not there to do this work. It's a batch processor, basically. So why didn't, didn't I want to run this on the JVM? It's pretty easy. Well, the JVM is growing in terms of big data and stuff like that. All this, I mean, alone the Hadoop ecosystem has around about 160 project around, projects around. Uh, every now and then, a new one is popping up. Those of you who did Java will probably know this one. You know Maven? This is real big data on your machine. And well, yes, I want to find alternatives to the ecosystem. I wouldn't go deeper in with this one. You probably know this guy. Um, yeah, why queuing? All the others can do gazillions of messages per second, like trillions of messages per second and stuff like that without queuing. Well, by the, by the end of the day, it's either queues or ring buffers or whatever structures you use, you will blow up your memory. I mean, it's a, the, it's a limited number of data structures that you can use there. And I, I'm, what you need to know is what, it, it's, not, it's not a new thing, but whenever you flute your data store with data, you probably want to s separate it from the data delivery with a queue. It's a good idea, it's a seriously good idea, even with React as well. Why Erlang and Python? Well, Disco uses both Rabbit and Q. I'm a big fan of Rabbit. It's written in Erlang. And React, it's written in Erlang and C. And so this explains this uh, languages. I just wanted to keep it small, so it's just two of them. And well, yes, Python is very popular among scientists, probably more popular than Java. So I think that everybody who's doing this, this well, analytical work should actually go with Python and R and things like that before even trying to re-implement it in Java. Well, yes, isn't Python s slow? Yes, at some points it's slow. It can be where you can use PyPy or go with CPython, whatever. Um, but for my numbers, it was sufficient. It's not important to this conference. MBA is boring. How about web scale? We know about web scale. Let's make it web scale. Well, actually, I'm operating on web data, right? So Twitter doesn't give me more, but I can go with DataSift or GNIP, who are delivering bigger streams, like 10% of everything. I can suck from it, and I, it's, it's real. Uh, it's a lot of information coming in. So 
Let's, let's just look at scalability points. It's Rabbit, I can scale with Rabbit, I can scale my queues, I can scale through exchanges and stuff like that. I can st scale storage with React and I can swear it works. Yeah, I'm almost done. Um, and I can also scale with Disco in this case. Well, it's still an experiment. Uh, so Disco nodes are running on React nodes. It's uh, from React point of view, it's not probably not the best solution. So I can also scale with feeds and streams and whatever comes in. So yes, web scale. What's in the future? Well, I have considered, I didn't, I didn't come far enough. I wanted to do two things, implementing peak latent engine in Python, it's not interesting, but contributing to Disco, it's, it's a little bit hard from the time perspective right now, contributing to Disco, just merging what I did with what they are doing, seems to be interesting for these guys as well. So let's just finish this one. What is the big data? because I'm over time. Big data, you, when you do a big data project, whatever, however small it is, you have to answer two, uh, three questions. What what I want to do? What, I, what, what is it what I want to know? Then you will find out the analytical model for this in order to answer these questions. And then you will decide what tools these are. And it's not only one tool, one Hadoop, whatever. Um, the next very interesting thing is This perspective of filtering, don't let garbage come into your data stores. Don't expect these huge data amounts, and this is the big, this, this misinterpretation of this big and this nonsense term. Namely, don't let garbage come in, because garbage in, garbage out. I mean, the rule is very old. It's older than my grandfather. So don't let this garbage come in. Just concentrate on building quality models around quality data and ensure that the data which is stored for analytics is clean enough. For expo expo exploratory analytics, you will, would have like chaotic samples, but you will try to find out some, some patterns and then you will know what you have to clean out. Those whom I know who are collecting everything, they don't analyze this. They have never did this, seriously. And this is the main thing. And experiments like this can, can even bring you further in this area. Whatever tools these are, we should be open for tools. And this is basically it with this presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Pablo.